Dominicana, director ejecutivo del Instituto Nacional de Protección de los Derechos del Consumidor y presidente del Foro Iberoamericano de Agencias Gubernamentales de Expertos en Materia de Protección de los Derechos del Consumo. Quiero en primer lugar saludar a Teresa Moreira y a todo el equipo de la UNTAC por habernos facilitado la oportunidad de participar en este webinar sobre resolución de litigios de consumo transfronterizo. En primer lugar, quiero resaltar eh, el hecho de que cuando nosotros llegamos a la institución en la República Dominicana, lo primero que hicimos fue revisar la norma nuestra y las demás leyes sectoriales procurando encontrar las debilidades y la fortaleza de la misma. Además de hacer un ejercicio de derecho comparado con todas las normas de la región, procurando a ver de qué manera podríamos nosotros actuando en conjunto fortalecer eh, la protección de los derechos del consumo de todos nuestros conciudadanos. La primera debilidad que encontramos fue precisamente la que nosotros vamos a abordar en este momento. En el sentido de que cuando estábamos en plena pandemia, nosotros pudimos ser testigos del crecimiento vertiginoso del comercio electrónico. ¿Y por qué no? ¿Cómo venía creciendo ese tipo de comercio estando el consumidor en un país diferente al del proveedor? Y como la nueva norma de cada país nuestro plantea los procedimientos y los resultados en la solución de estos conflictos, pudimos nosotros darnos cuenta de que no había una alternativa para la resolución de conflictos cuando el proveedor se encuentra en un país diferente al del consumidor. Y desde ese momento comenzamos a hacer un abordaje primero regional con los países de Centroamérica y posteriormente con los países iberoamericanos. Ahí pudimos darnos cuenta de que la mayoría de las agencias estaban ajenas a la velocidad real en que venía creciendo el comercio transfronterizo. Y sin embargo, pudimos nosotros hacer una alianza primero a través del Consejo Centroamericano con los países de Centroamérica y posteriormente con los países de Iberoamérica a través del Foro Iberoamericano. Y la idea era abordar los temas que pudieran dar lugar a la transformación, a la resolución de conflicto transfronterizo. En Centroamérica, por ejemplo, firmamos un acuerdo de colaboración voluntaria con la finalidad de nosotros colaborar con el consumidor si el proveedor se encuentra en uno de nuestro territorio. Pero además, propusimos también que este acuerdo voluntario nosotros pudiéramos extenderlo a los países iberoamericanos. Pero, de mutuo acuerdo, tan pronto asumimos la presidencia del foro, pues nos propusimos presentar una solicitud de declaratoria en la mesa de la UNTAD, en las Naciones Unidas, del cual recibimos todo el respaldo de las autoridades de, de este organismo eh, internacional. Y nos correspondió en esta octava sección de trabajo hacer la presentación, presentando los planteamientos además de todo lo que nosotros entendíamos que era lo necesario para que entonces las Naciones Unidas en la reunión de Consejo de Ministros que se va a celebrar el año que viene, pues pudiera abordar este tema y entonces con todos los aportes que vamos a hacer los países nuestros, tanto los iberoamericanos como todos los miembros de las Naciones Unidas, pudiéramos encontrar alternativas de solución a este tipo de conflicto. Hemos recibido el respaldo de muchos países de todo el continente. Primero, además de que se interesaron en el tema, presentando planteamientos y alternativas para poder resolver estos conflictos. Porque como dijimos en la solicitud de declaratoria, si el comercio electrónico sigue creciendo a la velocidad que nosotros hemos visto en los últimos tres años, también el comercio electrónico transfronterizo, donde el proveedor estará fuera del territorio del consumidor, pues entonces nosotros para el año 2040 no tendríamos ninguna alternativa de solución para proteger los derechos y los intereses de los consumidores de todos los países del planeta. Y logramos la aprobación el día 2 de julio del presente año 
y además de que recibimos aportes de importantes países para fortalecer esa solicitud declaratoria, a, a los cuales nosotros le enviamos nuestros saludos y, y agradecimiento también. Es fundamental que nosotros fortalezcamos esa declaratoria. Es fundamental además de que todos los países orienten a los ministros de Relaciones Exteriores que van a participar en la reunión en las Naciones Unidas del Consejo de Ministros para que ellos aborden este tema. Porque de lo contrario, ya para el año precedentemente señalado, el 80% de todas las transacciones van a ser por la vía electrónica. Y de ese 80%, se proyecta que entre un 62 y un 64% tendría el proveedor fuera de territorio. Entonces, si no tenemos alternativas que pudieran comenzar a abordarse de inmediato, muchas oficinas eh, de protección de los derechos del consumidor no tendrían razón de ser. Su existencia sería innecesaria con relación a este tema. Por eso, le he hecho un llamado a todos los países interesados en ayudarnos a crear mecanismos que pudiéramos poner en las manos de nuestros ministros para que al final en la discusión pues pudiéramos nosotros encontrar esas alternativas que pudiera ser una, pero también pudieran ser varias. Pero el objetivo fundamental es que podamos tener la capacidad de nosotros proteger a todos los consumidores del mundo a través de la creación de directrices que nos permitan a nosotros como oficina garantizar la protección efectiva de todos nuestros consumidores en comercio electrónico transfronterizos. Y en segundo lugar, y por último, de nada valdría o valdrían los esfuerzos de todos los países que hemos abordado este tema si no contamos con el apoyo de todos los gobiernos miembros de las Naciones Unidas, para que de manera particular, a través de los ministros de Relaciones Exteriores, apoyen y le den seguimiento firme a nuestro planteamiento, al interés que tenemos de nosotros hacer que estos temas sean abordados con seriedad y que los consumidores sepan que nosotros en definitiva, tenemos las alternativas para resolver los conflictos que se generan cuando ellos transan con el proveedor estando fuera de su territorio. Muchas gracias a ustedes y esperamos contar con su respaldo. Hasta la próxima. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias, doctora Alcántara. Um, thank you very much for your words and for leading the efforts of the adoption of this decision that gives Agder a challenging and rich uh, task in front. Let us now move to session one on the current state of consumer dispute resolution. Please allow me to present our distinguished speakers. We have today with us Alexander Shi Shiyosaki, General Coordinator of the National Consumer Protection Information System of Senacon, Brazil. Dr. Wim Terilla Piram, Director of the International Cooperation Section at the Office of the Consumer Protection Board, OCPB, from Thailand. We also have Sonia Passos, Head of the Consumer Communication Department at the Directorate General for Consumer Affairs of DGC Portugal. Marilia Oliveira, Senior Legal Manager Consumer Dispute Resolution at Mercado Libre, Latin America. And also Arnaud Isaguerri, Legal Officer at the Competition and Consumer Policies Branch of the UN Trade and Development. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, we will begin this session by presenting the main findings of a UN Trade and Development Report titled Consumer Dispute Resolution in the World. And for this, I will pass the floor to my colleague Arnaud. Please Arnaud. Thank you, Valentina. Can you hear me well? You can. Excellent. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. It is a pleasure to be here today as a legal officer at the Competition and Consumer Policies Branch to present our UN Trade and Development publication titled Consumer Dispute Resolution in the World. 
This publication was prepared by a team led by Alex Chung and Ying Yu with substantive contributions from Anna Cipriano, Valentina Rivas, and me. It was produced under the framework of the UNCTAD Technical Cooperation Project entitled Delivering Online Dispute Resolution for Consumers as Means to Enhance International Trade and E-Commerce and funded by the China Silk Road Group between 2020 and 2022. The availability of effective consumer dispute resolution and redress is recognized by the United Nations General Assembly as a basic consumer legitimate need. The United Nations guidelines for consumer protection recommend that member states encourage the development of fair, effective, transparent, and impartial mechanisms to address consumer complaints through administrative, judicial, and alternative dispute resolution, including for cross-border cases. This report provides a thorough analysis of how different countries approach the challenge of ensuring that consumers have access to fair and effective mechanisms for resolving disputes. The evolving landscape of digital commerce accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic has only made this topic more urgent. Cross-border e-commerce is growing rapidly, and with it comes an increasing number of consumer disputes that need timely, cost-effective solutions. Today, I will focus on three main areas. The key conclusions from our report, the challenges we have identified, and perhaps more importantly, the recommendations we have developed to help improve consumer dispute resolution systems around the world. So let's start um, with the global landscape of consumer dispute resolution. And here is a brief overview of where we stand globally when it comes to consumer dispute resolution. Consumer dispute resolution systems are critical to ensure that consumers resolve issues with businesses in a timely, affordable, and transparent manner. This includes mainly non-judicial alternatives such as mediation, arbitration, and in some jurisdictions, small claim tribunals that can also be judicial can also be considered to be part of dispute resolution mechanisms. As the world becomes more interconnected and as e-commerce continues to rise, these mechanisms must adapt to new challenges, especially in terms of handling larger volumes and cross-border disputes. Unfortunately, many parts of the world are still struggling to implement consumer dispute resolution systems that are accessible to all consumers. While some countries have made great strides in creating effective consumer dispute resolution frameworks, others face significant hurdles in making these systems operational, let alone user-friendly. In the European Union, for example, we have seen a comprehensive and well-coordinated legal framework that supports consumer dispute resolution across member states. It is the only comprehensive attempt to coordinate the cross-border dispute resolution for consumers. And it has already showed the many challenges that lay ahead, such as low business participation and inconsistent responses to consumer complaints. In the report, you will find a spotlight on the national examples of Brazil, China, Colombia, Mexico, the Netherlands, Portugal, and the United Kingdom, and the regional experience of the European Union. Now, moving to some of the key findings from our research. First, one of the most pressing challenges is ensuring universal access to consumer dispute resolution. In many regions, consumer dispute resolution mechanisms are only accessible to a portion of the population, typically in urban centers. Rural areas where internet access may be limited are often undeserved. The digital divide is particularly concerning when it comes to online dispute resolution, which has grown in importance during the pandemic. Second, we found a lack of awareness as a major barrier, both for consumers and for businesses. Many consumers do not know where or how to seek redress when disputes arise, especially in online and cross-border transactions. Even in countries with well-established consumer dispute resolution systems, awareness among the general public remains low. Third, there are significant gaps in business participation. Even where dispute resolution mechanisms exist, many businesses, especially smaller enterprises, are reluctant to engage. In some cases, business simply aren't aware of their obligations or they see participation as burdensome or costly. We've seen in countries like Brazil and Portugal that mandating participation in consumer dispute resolution system can dramatically improve outcomes. However, in regions where participation is voluntary, businesses are often slow to engage. In the European Union, for instance, only about 30% of businesses participate in alternative dispute resolution processes. 
This is a missed opportunity because businesses that do engage often find that resolving disputes through online dis uh, alternative dispute resolution is more cost effective than litigation. Fourth, cross-border disputes remain a critical challenge due to the fragmented nature of international legal frameworks. While e-commerce has enabled consumers to purchase goods and services from anywhere in the world, resolving disputes across borders is often complicated by differing legal frameworks and jurisdictional issues. Without a globally coordinated system, many consumers are left without a viable path to redress or dispute resolution when something goes wrong with a transaction involving a foreign business. While international instruments such as the UN Guidelines for Consumer Protection and the OECD recommendations offer some guidance, there is no global binding framework for resolving consumer disputes. This leaves consumers vulnerable, especially when disputes arise from cross-border transactions. Finally, sustainable funding for consumer dispute resolution mechanisms is an ongoing issue. Many countries rely on public funding to support the systems, but this is often not enough. When funding is insufficient, it limits the capacity of consumer dispute resolution bodies to handle disputes efficiently, leading to delays and diminishing consumer trust. Now let's turn to what we believe needs to be done to address these challenges. Based on our research, UNCTAD has developed a series of recommendations aimed at improving consumer dispute resolution systems globally. First and foremost, we recommend that countries strengthen their national legal frameworks for consumer protection and for dispute resolution. This includes updating laws to reflecting the realities of digital commerce and ensuring that consumer dispute resolution systems are accessible to all consumers, regardless of where they live or the economic status. Legal frameworks need to be harmonized where possible, especially to facilitate the resolution of cross-border disputes. Second, we believe that business participation in consumer dispute resolution should be mandatory in certain sectors. We've seen this work in the United Kingdom financial services sector, where businesses are required by law to participate in dispute resolution mechanisms. When businesses are involved, disputes are resolved more quickly and consumer trust in the system grows. When participation is not mandatory by law, it should be encouraged through agreements with the Consumer Protection Authority. We also recommend sustainable funding models for consumer dispute resolution bodies. Governments cannot be the sole funders of this system. Private sector contributions, particularly from business and business associations that benefit from consumer dispute resolution, should be part of the solution. In Brazil, for instance, a public partner private partnership model has helped their national platform resolve millions of consumer complaints while reducing pressure on the courts. Furthermore, consumer dispute resolution decisions should be made enforceable by law. Too often, consumers uh, with their dispute um, struggle uh, to enforce the decisions when they reach because it's not binding or requires further legal action. If, excuse me, ensuring that consumer dispute resolution decisions are legally binding and can be enforced without additional litigation would dramatically improve the system's effectiveness. Raising consumer awareness is another key recommendation. Governments, consumer protection agencies, businesses, and consumer groups all have a role to play in ensuring that consumers know their rights and how to access dispute resolution mechanisms. Public awareness campaigns supported by clear and simple guidance can help bridge this gap. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, international cooperation is crucial. We need more coordination between countries to handle cross-border disputes effectively. A global platform for online dispute resolution, one that is harmonized across legal systems, would go a long way toward addressing these gaps, the gaps we see today. This is not just a theoretical idea, it is an achievable goal if countries come together to create common standards and practices for resolving disputes and transcend borders. <laughs> Excuse me. In conclusion, improving consumer dispute resolution is critical for fostering trust in both national and global markets. Consumers need to know that when things go wrong, there are accessible, efficient, and effective mechanisms in place to help them resolve their disputes. Our report makes it clear that while there is not much, there's still much work to be done, the foundations are there. 
by improving national legal frameworks, increasing business participation, ensuring sustainable funding, and fostering international cooperation, we can build a more just and efficient system for resolving consumer disputes globally. I thank you for your time and attention. Together, we can take the necessary steps to strengthen consumer protection and make dispute resolution systems work for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arnau, for providing the framework for the upcoming roundtable discussion. If you uh, have questions on the report, please write this in the chat so we can address some of these questions at the end of the session. And if this is not the case, we will make sure to answer the questions by email. Let's move now to the first speaker, uh, Alexandre Shiosaki from Senacom Brazil. And UN trade and development findings suggest that Brazilian tools like consumidor.gov.br are highly successful, resolving over 80% of disputes in just six days. What key features make this platform so effective? And for consumers protection agencies starting their own dispute resolution platforms, what are the essential factors to ensure effectiveness and build consumer trust? Alexander, the floor is yours. Alexander, I can see, we can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Alexander? We have test your sound before and everything was fine. Let's wait for another couple of seconds. And if we don't hear from him, I see that he's connected. Okay, I think that we should move. Alexander, are you there? Okay, I think that maybe may better we move to the second speaker. Um, and I would like to call for Wim, Wim Teriyabiram from OCPB Thailand. Um, Wim, so the question will be that as also our, um, we know that Thailand has recently restructured its consumer dispute resolution system. Uh, we want to know what new elements. Thank you very much for that opinion. Uh, Wim, so yes. the question will be that as also our, um, we know that Thailand has recently restructured its consumer dispute resolution system. Uh, we want to know what new elements. Thank you very much, Valentina, and thank you very much on the team to invite me for this um, great occasion to share the information about the ODR system of Thailand. Um, consumer Protection in Thailand is managed by the Office of the Consumer Protection Board, or we call OCPB, which is divided into central and regional office. Valentina, please, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, the central office has a total of 450 staff members, while the regional office have only 150 staff members across 76 provinces. We have investigators who assist consumers by receiving complaints, investigating facts, gathering documents and evidence, and conducting mediations. There are 60 officers in the central office and 150 in regional office, while Thailand have over 60 million consumers. This presents a challenge in um, determining how we can help consumers without increasing the number of officers. We believe that 
IT innovation can assist us. So we developed the ODR, or we call our online display resolution for sales for use in our agency in 2019. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, yes. Um, initially, the results were not as um, effective as expected. The major problem we encountered was that ODR system is voluntary, which led to most businesses did not participate in mediation through the ODR system. However, after the outbreak of COVID-19, everything was shut down, including our agency. It was at the same time that ODR system began to play a crucial role as a tool that allowed us to assist consumers from home. Even though our office was closed, we continue working every day. Scheduling mediations daily, businesses start to accept the system more because it helped them reduce the cost of traveling to meet our office um, more uh, more importantly, it minimized face-to-face -face encounters with the consumers who were often easily angry during the COVID lockdown. And I'd like to share that most complaints during the COVID lockdown involve flight rescheduling, um, hotel cancellations, and refunds for unfulfilled travel plans. We were fortunate to have ODR system in place to handle complaints and assist consumers during that time. After this situation, we further developed our ODR system to be more user-friendly, recognizing that the elderly person and those with limited literacy were beginning to use our services. Our ODR process is divided into six main modules. The first module is disliked. Uh, it show that uh, is the system involved receiving complaints through the online system, which that um, which um, contain a route that we collaborate with the twenty two relevant agency together. When consumers want to complain, they register all of its page. And when we receive the complaint, we will forward to a unit that we call scrutinize unit. They will screen all of the cases and then forward the case to the um, um to the other agency who have power to manage the case. But uh, more than sixty percent of all complaints we have to manage by ourselves. The next slide, please. The second step of ODR system is um, when we receive the complaint and the complaint is under our act or our law, we have to manage it by ourselves. We have to make like an appointment with two parties versus business person. And the second is consumers. We invite them to join our mediation meeting but we have two level of the mediation meeting first is the mediation meeting in the officer level it's the easy case um because it's not too too much so we can manage by ourselves but when we make the mediation two times but and we cannot um deal with the case we cannot make any agreement we will forward the case to the subcommittee on mediation the subcommittee on mediation will make the meeting online also and it's free of charge for our consumers and businesses this is the ocpb mediate system it's um it's like a channel on the odr system next slide please the next is e agreement which on the our odr system after uh, we talk with the parties, with the business person and with the um, uh, consumers and we reach the agreement together. We will make like the agreement. 
um, 10 years ago, we make like a paper and we will send by fax or email and uh, the parties print out and then they sign and they send by post to us. I think it's spent too long time. So we create like an e-agreement that we can send to both parties by email, by all by system. When they receive this agreement and they read and understand all of it, if they agree with them, they will sign like e-signature and click, then it submit and return to our system. And this agreement can use in the court. We have the court that special court we call the consumer court. Next slide, please. And the next is the fourth modules. It's the follow-up for grades. We have a channel that um, both party business and consumers can log in and can follow up um, the case or the process. Sometimes uh, we need more documents. Sometimes we need um, just like name of evidence. Sometimes we need the receipt. So we will type in this um, channel and then the consumers come up and check which one we have to, we, which one we need more. And they can send any documents or any photo by attached file in this, um, in this page. And they can follow up that now um, their complaint is under whose hand. The next slide, please. The module five um, allow consumers and business person to schedule appointments with our officers to submit additional documents or request further inquiries through ODL system. This page uh, in Thai, but we have um, an English version to support the foreigners. Next slide, please. And the final module, it's a step for searching information necessary for consumers purchasing decisions. We have a system that allows consumers to look up which companies have previously been um, litigated under consumer courts so they can use this information to make purchasing decisions. Um, we hope that in the future, the number of complaints will decrease to be zero if consumers exercise caution and research before making purchases. Next slide, please. One of the legal tools that has contributed to the success of our ODR um, process is that we have a law stipulating that our officers have the legal authority to require businesses to submit documents or provide explanation regarding complaints. If the businesses fail to comply, um, they face a criminal penalty of up to 10,000 baht. Next slide, please. Additionally, we have um, received excellent support from UNCTAD in developing a blockchain system for uh, managing consumer complaints, which is now a draft of IT infrastructure. We are seeking additional funding to further develop this system. UNCTAD is also helping us design and develop a pre-mediation system, which is Thank you very much, uh, Wim. <clears throat> it caught, but I think that you, we understood that you were just uh, closing. Uh, thank you very much. And yes, congratulations for, for the new features, mostly the ones in relationship to bring justice to vulnerable consumers that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. Let's now try to go back to Brazil, to Senacon. Alexander, um, are you there? Let's try. If you can unmute yourself, and then we just can go with your question. It's his headset. Oh. I don't know why we don't have Alexander anymore. 
Uh, so let's move to speaker, the third speaker that we have in the list uh, is Sonia Passos. Hello, Valentina, how are Thank you? Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, so UNCTAD research shows that Portugal accepts complaints from non-Portuguese consumers. Uh, what key elements of Livro de Reclamações facilitates international consumer access to this peer resolution? And how do you see these features, um, the impact that these features have in the Portuguese consumer protection system to build consumers and tourist trust? And then another question that it's a little bit uh, that goes together hand, hand by hand is for consumer protection agencies, again, starting their dispute resolution platforms. What are the essential elements to ensure foreign consumer access to this peer resolution? Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank the you. Is yours. Uh, I also have a presentation. I will try to, to answer this, this question. If I don't, please remind me. The, the <laughs> Thank you. So I'll try here. Can you see the presentation? Yes. OK. Um, so I'll start by, um, just a second. yes, um, this is uh, very briefly, uh, I'm going to explain that we have two different uh, instruments. We are the complaints book or lived reclamations in Portugal and also the ADR entities. And depending uh, on what you want, you choose one way or the other, but in a way they are complementary. Um, because the complaints books has, has um, been created uh, to make a formal complaint. If there is an illegal procedure uh, made by a trader, you should complain in the complaint books. That, that was the aim of the complaint book. Nonetheless, consumers as used by, for everything uh, to, to make a complaint, to try to solve uh, a consumer problem or even to make suggestions. Uh, um, so uh, this, uh, this book that has uh, been created in a physical format in, in 2005, uh, and it was the, the, um, the year that this book, that is older than that, uh, has uh, been spread to all the economic sectors. So any economic sector, even health, uh, has this uh, um, book. And it followed a uniform um, procedure. There is harmonization. And that was the, the gain that we had in 2005. Um, the format that uh, if, you, if you haven't been to Portugal and you have been to a store uh, to uh, uh, buying something, you might have seen uh, the, the, the sign of this complaint book or even use it. Because as a foreigner, you can also use this uh, complaint book. So we have uh, harmonization concerning um, procedures. Uh, and uh, if you use it in a physical way, it has, it, you, you are given um, a copy, a duplicate, a triplicate or a duplicate uh, in a blue page. And the yellow page is uh, in, the, um, in the book. Um, and uh, the original is sent to the enforcer of that section, that specific section. Uh, so, um, this is the format of, of physical, but you can also have uh, a digital uh, form, which is more interesting, at least for this, for this uh, workshop. Um, in 2007, uh, because the, the, there were many traders that only sell online and none of them uh, had this procedure. So it was an unbalanced system. We had um, the stores that had a physical establishment that had, had many rules uh, and this obligation to have the book. And we have the, the traders that only sell it online, we were growing at the time and even more now, that were completely outside the system. So we brought them to the system that was an extraordinary work made by Portugal and by DG Consumer. Um, and with the support of, uh, of, of a technical um, uh, partner, uh, we, we brought it to, to life. Uh, step by step, sector by sector, regulator by regulator, and we integrated in a platform. Uh, it took about three, four years to, to bring all the sectors to the, to the platform. So nowadays we have the book in the physical 
uh, format, you have a platform and an app. And this is the, the image of the complaints book nowadays. We have three areas, one for the consumer, one for the trader, and one for the 35 enforcers or regulatory uh, entities. They now integrate the, the platform. And you can also uh, not only make a complaint, of course, you can view the complaint and the, the handling of the complaint by the, by the trader and by the, the um, regulatory enforcer, or you can, complement or make a suggestion. Nowadays, it's other figures since the summer of uh, 2017. Uh, we have nowadays more, more than 400 um, traders registered, which is very good. Uh, we have 35, as I said, regulatory supervisor, supervisor authorities um, also registered. And uh, we have um, uh, uh, we have more than one million uh, complaints. It's about uh, nowadays um, uh, four hundred complain four hundred thousand complaints a year. Um, unfortunately, consumers complain more than give compliments. So you can see uh, the, the numbers of the compliments or the suggestions are are lower. And we can, and traders can also uh, make through this platform um, requests of information. This request of information, as you see, 34,000 uh, are made not for the traders, but for the uh, enforcers. In a way, it's a way to avoid making a complaint because, as, as you might know, many consumers or some consumers only want information or are not aware of their uh, rights. Um, the format, uh, digital format, uh, the, the, the platform is also in English, so it's in Portugal and, and in English, so you can see it if you want. Uh, and what does the, com the competent authority uh, do? Um, it will examine the complaint and adopt a proper procedure. Uh, if there is an illegal practice, that's not the objective of the, the complaint, and uh, we'll take the, the appropriate measures, a recommendation, a fine, whatever. Uh, if it is not an illegal, um, there is no need for, for this kind of procedure, there's no illegal practice, so it will inform the consumer of the ADR competent entity. These NDR competitive entities, we have a long uh, history of um, and a successful story of uh, using ADR. Uh, but nowadays, and uh, our experience has shown that if you don't make it mandatory, it was quite interesting to see her now um, talking about the conclusion because uh, reaching to the only to the, the first four, we are mainly, your recommendations are already implemented in Portugal. Um, and yes, we found that only making mandatory um, uh, ADR, ADR means uh, mandatory it was a solution for us. Still in Portugal, although um, or any conflict up to 5,000 years, uh, traders must go to to ADR if the consumer wants it. If the consumer wants it, we find that still awareness among consumers is it's low, or the trust in these means. Uh, some some consumers um, are still um, have doubts about what is arbitration. Uh, maybe it is the term. It's, I think it's a common thing in other countries in the EU. Uh, so awareness, it's one of the things that we have to, to talk in education, more than awareness, educate consumers for ADR means. We have uh, 11 ADR bodies in Portugal uh, nowadays. Um, seven, seven uh, or seven have uh, generic regional competence. So it's a close uh, information to, to, the, to, the, to the people that live near those uh, ADRs. Uh, other two have national competence and two have na national expertise competence in um, insurance sector and travel agency. Uh, 
all territory is covered, all sectors are covered. The only sector is not covered because it, it's a man, it's in, uh, we belong to, to the EU and um, only health uh, sector is not covered by ADR uh, among um, covering this, uh, this specific legislation. Still, there are arbitration centers and there are consumer centers that uh, have this task of dealing with the problem with health sector. So everyone has this, uh, this, uh, um, this kind of alternative dispute. Um, the G consumer uh, has the, the responsibility to notify uh, the European Commission of the new ADR entities. We monitor also the compliance with the obligations and we coordinate this network. Um, and I'm ending almost. Um, so we handle, um, or ADR, entities handled uh, around 12,000 complaints a year. Uh, we think that it's very low still, so the awareness is needed. The, ti the, ti the average uh, uh, file time frame is uh, less nowadays than 70 days. No fees in most of them, or very moderate fees. Uh, and most of them are, are solved uh, through mediation. So to sum up, we can say that the complaints book um, in both physical and digital format can be used by Portuguese and uh, foreigner consumers, whether they are resident in Portugal or not. Uh, so any tourist that used the, the book to complain um, can even make the complaint online, even when we return home, attaching up to three documents if they wanted. For instance, um, an hotel invoice, a photo of the rental car, or uh, a recent price list. Therefore, it is correct to say that complaints book, as it is an instrument created by law involving penalties for the traders that, on, that don't answer to the consumer, works as a facilitator in, in solving consumer conflicts. Um, because the complaint is sent to the trader and at the same time to the enforcer. So it promotes conflict resolution. Nonetheless, it's not alternative dispute resolution as we know it. It's not mediation, uh, conciliation, arbitration. So uh, when when a complaint book doesn't work and doesn't resolve the conflict, we send the consumer to the ADR entity. This model was, uh, um, I admit, a bit difficult to implement in the in the in the beginning, not only uh, to convince traders, but also to convince um, uh, entities, uh, regulatory entities and forces. Uh, at nowadays, it's it's quite a success. And all these trade, all the traders, all the traders, most of them and um, enforcers and regulators are very keen on the success of this um, instrument. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, we can see the DG, DGC's Portugal's commitment to bring justice to non-Portuguese consumers. So thank you. Uh, let me now try to move again to Alexander. Alexander? Yes, then we can I'm hear you. Really... <laughs> <laughs> All good? No, no, no. no. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you share uh, your screen? Yes, yeah, sure. OK. So as I was saying before, even trade and development findings suggest that Brazilian, um, that Brazilian tools like consumidor.gov.br are highly successful, resolving over 80% of disputes in just six days. What key features make this platform so effective? And for consumer protection agencies starting their own dispute resolution platforms, what are the essential factors to ensure effectiveness and build consumer trust? Alexander, the floor is yours. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Um, so let me let me start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, it's it's literally it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this webinar as a consumer rights enthusiasts, I feel that it's very important for us to, to share these experiences. And I think collectively about 
how to improve citizens' lives. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Alexandre Shiozaki. I am an information technology analyst and I'm currently general coordinator of the National Consumer Protection Information System at the National Consumer Secretariat. I work here since 2013. And here we are responsible of three systems, SIMDEC, ProConsumidor, and consumidor.gov.br. Uh, our focus today will be consumidor.gov.br as it is an excellent public policy that seeks to resolve consumers' conflicts 100% online. Uh, another information, as you can see at my presentation, uh, that the platform had its birthday uh, this year. It turned 10 years old. Let's start with the, this presentation. I'll show you about some information about the system, and at the end, I will answer the two questions suggested by this webinar. So, consumidor.gov.br is a free public service that allows direct communication between consumers and companies to resolve consumer disputes online. About the service, uh, as I said before, it's free public service and that allows direct communication between consumers and companies to solve consumers' problems, uh, provides the state with the essential information for the development and implementation of public policies to protect consumers and encourages market competitiveness in improving quality and customer service. And that's the, the main idea. Uh, it's available at the Android and iOS store. So if we have this app and also we, we have this application programming interface API that is a set of functionalities that allow systems to interact uh, with our system, contributing to the management of the company, the, the companies and managers, uh, as we can talk about later. Uh, we have also the National School of Consumer Protection. So there we can, we have a lot of courses there about the, the consumer. Uh, what they have to do about the system, uh, about the consumer's rights, but how the platform works. First, the consumer registers the complaint, then the company responds. The company has 10 days to do it, and the consumer evaluates, uh, he has 20 days to do it, uh, and everyone monitors. Again, it's publicly free and transparent. That's the, the most important thing. About the, the data, we have some information here. We, since the beginning, we have over 8 million complaints that have already been completed. And we have over 1,400 companies. Uh, but what of What's the difference with these companies? Yeah, they these member companies sign uh, a term of commitment, and they need to keep up with the demands on the platform. Yeah, it's, it's not enough for the the consumer to register to register the complaint. The the company must respond it. Here are some platform numbers. In 2023, we have almost 78% of solution. Uh, the, so it's average response time six days. And all the year of 2023, there was uh, over 1,300,000 complaints that were finalized. And these 98% complaints were answered. And we have this average consumer rating, 2.79, and the max is 5, so it's 
it's a it's a good number. Uh, we also have this public BI in the statistical dashboard. Uh, you, it's you, everyone can can use this in all these informations. So we have the the total of complaints. We have the solutions. We have here uh, some some stats about the the consumer, the male, female. You can do. Uh, you can see and do with these filters. Uh, you have a lot of information that you can have with this. We have some partnerships too. Uh, here we call Procons. Uh, they are, uh, we have industry publics, public ministers, and we have these defense publics too that help us to monitor the, the platform, not only the platform, but the, the system of it. We have some judiciary partnership too, and cooperation between Senacom here and Courts of Justice with the aim of encouraging the reducing and prevention of judicial disputes through the consumidor.gov.pr platform. We have some integration with this PGE. It's a, part, it's a partnership with the National Council of Justice, CNJ, and the Ministry of Justice and Public Security here, uh, through the National Secretary for Consumers and the National Council of Justice, integrated the consumidor.gov.br platform in the electronic judicial process. This initiative aims to facilitate the conciliation and negotiation of agreements before the court hearing. Uh, with this new feature, users who filled a lawsuit against one of the companies registered on the platform uh, will be able to attempt online negotiation without this delay and interfering of the progress of the, law, the legal process, how it works. Uh, when filling a lawsuit with this PGE involving a consumer law issue in a special court, uh, it's similar to a small claim court, uh, with or without a lawyer, the user will be asked if they are interested in trying to resolve the conflict through the consumer.gov.br platform. If you show interest, uh, the data registered with starting the process will be used both to form your complaint on that platform and to automatically uh, generate an, an initial petition with the PGE. So it's, it's a, we, we did an, an IPI here. We have some uh, Agencies here, another external bodies, uh, for example, uh, this first one, the National Civil Aviation Agency, uses our system as, as their official service system. This first one's ANAC. We have some future planning. We are doing, we are almost finishing in this one. This is, Basically, it's a word cloud, so we can know what words is the most used um, on complaints. So we have these filters, and, and as, as you can see, it, there are a lot of words that show us, for example, a uh, bank. And so we can know about the most common words that are being used. We have another BI dashboard. This, this one here uh, has more features. It's not uh, public yet, but we want to, to do it uh, maybe easier or next year. And we have this webinar questions. What key features make this platform so effective? Uh, and I believe that what makes this platform so effective is everyone's participation. And uh, achieve this. Here are our challenges. 
we must provide a reliable, accessible, and user-friendly system. Because here, the, the, this consumer.gov.br is the, the consumer um, complaining uh, directly to the, the company. So we do, we, we only um, we don't have the system for them to negotiate there. We don't mediate this with the, the, the complaint exactly. Uh, the second, encouraging consumers to always be aware of their rights, offering courses into consumer protection, promote the platform and encourage consumers to be more active in participatory, uh, monitor and follow up the company's conduct on the platform. The, com the companies themselves end up promoting the platform by competing with each other. And we have external bodies that use the platform as a work tool, monitoring and helping to control the platform. For example, the, as I said before, the National City of Aviation Agents use the platform officially, monitoring consumer complaints against aviation co companies. So that, that's the, the, our challenges to, that's what makes uh, the platform so effective. Uh, really believe it. And the next question was for consumer protection agencies starting their own dispute resolution platforms, what are the essential factors to ensure effectiveness and build consumer trust? Uh, in addition to what was said previously, it was very important to create a dialogue with consumers and be very close to companies building a health and collaborative partnership. It's very important, this collaborative partnership. Right? For the system to work, it needs to be sustainable. We need that parties involved are actually included in their two competence, competences and responsibilities. Uh, the consumer needs to be active and interested. The company must want to resolve the complaint and the, the government must prioritize consumer protection. This is very important too. Uh, over time, the system itself will advertise itself, meaning the consumers will want to use it and the companies will want to be part of the platform too. Uh, I want, just want to thank you again and Valentina, sorry about the, the the problem we have here. But... No problem. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alessander. We see that the work cooperation or cooperation among stakeholders is key to the success uh, of, of the Brazilian platform. So thank you very much for this. Let me now move to our fourth panelist of the day, uh, Marilia Oliveira, Senior Legal Manager uh, of Consumer Dispute Resolution at Mercado Libre Latam. Mercado Libre recently produced a report on the state of consumer online dispute resolution in Latin America. Could you please share the key findings and explain how is Mercado Libre striving to protect consumers based on these insights, please? Thank you very much, Mirilia. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to represent the company. First, I'd like to give you a little background about my company. Today, Mercado Libre has the largest online e-commerce and payment ecosystem in Latin America. Our efforts are centered on enabling e-commerce, e-commerce and fintech services for our customers. And we have operations in 18 countries. Mercado Libre and SMC Plus Digital Public Affairs have put together a report called the importance of online dispute resolution systems in consolidating e-commerce growth in Latin America. This report shows that in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, there will be an estimated average annual growth rate in e-commerce of 22% over the next five years. The increase in growth rates will triple the numbers of disputes between consumers and sellers. 
To deal with this exponential increase in e-commerce, it, it will be necessary to expand the OGR system. This system will serve as a fast and effective alternative to the existing court system, which at this time, most customers turn to when they have to resolve a dispute. The OGR system has benefits to all those involved. Among the main benefits of OGR is its ability to resolve a large volume of disputes in a short period of time and a low cost, which is a key factor in scalability and consumer experience. In this report, OGR systems are classified according to their technological level. The first level is this incipient, this, the incipient level in which the technology is very limited and most of the work is done by people, not machines. So there is no OGR platform. The second level is the expanded level in which there is an OGR platform that provides online contact between the parts. So the technology plays a big role in transactions. And the third level is the advanced level, in which technology plays a much bigger role than it plays in the expanded level. Sometimes artificial intelligence is used in the decision-making process. We don't have any public advanced OGR system operating in Latin America today. Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico are the Latin America countries that have already started implementing government-managed OGR system. These systems are the most developed in terms of dispute management on a single platform and bring many benefits to society. Consumidor.gov.br in Brazil, SIG Facilita in Colombia, and Concilianet in Mexico. However, one more step is needed to consolidate cutting-edge OGR models and address e-commerce growth, which is to provide OGR to countries don't have it, and to bring, bring countries at the incipient or expanded level up to advanced level. It is essential for governments, consumers, and companies to work together to be on the same page in order to find efficient and effect effective way to deal with this new reality. As I mentioned, the annual growth rate in e-commerce will probably cause the number of disputes to triple in the next five years, leading to an exponential increase to the government judicial budget. It is estimated that investing OGR technology could lead to a reduction in cost of up to $85 million. Our reports focus on only four countries. Imagine if we could increase e-commerce growth by 22% of all Latin America. We are in process of putting the finished touch on an updated report, which will be published in the near future. A few, a few years ago, Mercado Libre developed its own OGR system in several Latin American countries. We call it the Protect Purchase Program. Our users, buyers and sellers, can reach us through many different communication channels, but we resolve more than 85% of our disputes on an OGR platform. The Protect Purchase Program provides solutions for all buyers who not receive your products or receive your products, but is the wrong product or defective program pro product, or they just regretted the purchase purchase as long as the transaction satisfies the conditions established in the program. The Protect Purchase Program has two states. Before the first stage starts, the buyer must file a claim through the app or website. Once the, the claim is filed, st stage one starts. 
which gives the buyer and sellers to chance to resolve the issues themselves. They are given the opportunity to, communicate, to co communicate, uh, sorry, uh, with each other without Mercado Libre get involved in the process. If the buyer and seller cannot reach a solution within four days, stage two starts. The second stage is called mediation, where Mercado Libre gets involved. At this point, Mercado Libre will contact the user no later than 480 hours. If the buyer meets the necessary requirements, they will get their money back. The whole process, stage one and two, will not take the buyer more than 11 days to resolve the issue. As you can see, OGR system is both effective and efficient. It is a fast and reliable dispute resolution system. Last year, 71 million claims went through this program, 80% of which were resolved within a short period of time. How was it, how was it possible? 85% of 71 million claims resolved in one year. The answer, technology. The old just system worked. If you can continue this discussion, or if you'd like to send you a copy of the report, you can find my contact information in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Oliveira. The private sector perspective is key uh, to move towards better protection for consumers in digital market. It's also very rich in what you were saying about technology because this also connects with the second part of our webinar, session two, that will come after a break. But just to say that this is a, an important lien that we should, that image take or that phrase take to the second part of this webinar. So in the interest of time, uh, we will not uh, be able to answer questions live, but please write your questions in the chat so we can address this by email. Um, we will reply those questions directly to, to you by email. So I have one more question to the speakers before we close the first session of today's webinar. And to wrap up uh, in one minute, how do you envision the systems you work with integrating into a global solution for consumers worldwide? And additionally, additionally, how can ANCTA support this integration? You each have one minute to respond. Let's start with Wim, and then we move in the session that we um, that you intervene this morning. So Wim, the floor is you yours. You each have one, one minute, minute to respond. Thank Let's you. start with Wim, and then we move Katina. in the session that we um, that you intervene this morning. So Wim, the floor is yours. Okay. One minute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina, for this question. Um, I would like to share that now the the world is moving and everything is um under the digital economy. So we have to improve our system and we like to um co um cooperate with Anta to help us just like um the information um of the new technology and innovation. Um more than that, we would like to update Thank you very much. We might not think we can hear you. Um, let's let's now move to Sonia. Is this um could you hear it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. Yes, Sonia. You have um, one minute. Well, we believe that uh, harmonization and collaboration is uh, key for this. Uh, so we believe that uh, UNCTAD could, could help us raise, continue to raise awareness for, for, for start and then help in, agree, in obtaining agreements uh, in consumer dispute resolution um, with traders associations, uh, but also uh, involving consumer bodies. Um, we believe that promoting also certification of a platform that gives trust 
and real benefits for consumers, of course, but also for traders. Traders have to understand that, that this is advantage. And uh, yeah, traders that work well, that have uh, um, well-organized uh, companies, um, comparing it with others uh, that have don't have the care uh, enough. So what we think uh, it is needed, um, translation service, um, because it's a very global um, and overcome uh, the, the legal diversity. Um, and we believe that with some artificial intelligence, this could be very helpful. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. And we go with Alexander. You have one minute. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I believe that consumdo.gov.br has full potential to invade the world, <laughs> to be quite honest, let me say. Uh, here in South America, we already share the system with other countries, uh, and I think it would be very interesting to have a global solution. Uh, the greatest achievement uh, is not only the digitalization, <laughs> it's, been, it's been able to reach the repressive demands that are those demands that would not become known to anyone. And there are many. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, a, a different uh, experience, as here we have a lot of creativity on, in hiring consumers. <laughs> For example, uh, in many countries, when, you, when a product is broken, the company supply simply uh, offers a new product without the fact. In Brazil, we, we literally have to fight with some companies. But this experience put us ahead of many other countries. Here we, we say, uh, calm seas never make good sailors. But together, <laughs> we will be able to create a great network of knowledge and develop something great that has never been seen before. And nothing better than in, a, in the current era of connectivity. And this meeting would not be happening if we were not the, the reflection of this connected. So thank you, Kitan. This way, whatever you, you need my help with, we do have 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And now we have another minute for Marilia. Thank you. Uh, we believe uh, that you can come up with a global solution. We must find individual solution for each country and regional, reg regional solution. A unified, a uniform, standardized regional OGR system. Uh, at this stage, the role of the UNCTAD could be to provide a place uh, where countries can meet to exchange the ideas or the subjects so important uh, for us. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mirelia. Thank you very much to, to the speakers. So this first session gave us a screenshot of the state of consumer dispute resolution worldwide and highlighted challenges that all consumer protection agencies are going through. And of course, are those same challenges that consumers are going through. Harmonization, collaboration, technology, global solution. These are key words that have been mentioned several several times today. And this is the are words that we should keep in mind. Uh, this is food for thoughts. So let's now take a break and we will be back in 10 minutes. This is um, at 3.40.42 in Europe time. Then for the rest is only is just calculate 10 minutes and we will be back for the rest of the webinar. So thank you very much. Thanks for the panels, uh, the panelists of the first session. And we see you back in 10 minutes.
Hello, colleagues, and welcome back. Thank you for this break. We will now move to the second part of today's webinar. And um, this is very timely, as it is entitled The Evolving Consumer Dispute Resolution. What is next? In this section, we will present to you a recent UNCTAD publication entitled Technology and the Future of Online Dispute Resolution Platforms for Consumer Protection Agencies, which will be presented by my colleague Valentina Rivas that you already know. And it will be commented by Federico Ast, the founder and CEO of a dispute resolution mechanism company called Cleros. And we have two very distinguished and leading speakers in the world of online dispute resolution and dispute resolution for consumers in general. And this is Ms. Nidhi Kare, Secretary of the Department of Consumer Affairs of the Government of India, and Katia Peñalosa, Director of Consumer Protection of the National Institute for the Defense of Competition and the Protection of Intellectual Property of Peru. We will have a short time for Q and answer if um, time permits, but without further ado, Valentina, would you like to present our publication? Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon again. Now I'm changing roles and I will present the UN Trade and Development paper titled Technology and the Future of Online Dispute Resolution for Consumer Protection Agencies. This paper was prepared by William Taborda with substantive comments from Ana Cipriano, Arnaud Isaguerre, and me. Although written some time ago, our, our paper laid a foundation which we aim to build upon today regarding the use of emerging technologies in consumer dispute resolution. This paper explores how emerging uh, technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, and chatbots could reshape online dispute resolution ODR as digital transactions grow and consumer rights gain prominence, understanding these technologies is crucial. They hold the potential to transform how consumer disputes are resolved and play a pivotal role in advancing justice in the digital marketplace. Blockchain, commonly uh, linked to digital currencies like Bitcoin, can play a vital role in online dispute resolution. It acts as a decentralized digital ledger making it nearly impossible to alter any record without changing every copy, which enhances both security and trust. In ODR, uh, think of blockchain as a highly secure and transparent record keeping system. It's like having an unforgettable history of every transaction step by step. This is particularly, particularly useful in online purchase disputes where each phase of the transaction is recorded with precaution. However, it's important to know that not all blockchains are created equal, their effectiveness can vary based on how they are built and implemented. Some blockchains like Ethereum, Cerdano, and Solana are built for allowing the implementation of smart contracts. These are like self-executing agreements where the terms are written into codes. They can automatically handle tasks like verifying data and managing transactions. This is very relevant for ODR. It means we can automate this resolution, making things faster and more trustworthy. But it's not all smooth sailing. We've got to remember three key challenges here. Blockchain is new territory legally, so its use in ODR may face regulatory consequence um, questions, and especially uh, when it deals with smart contracts. Also, technical expertise is very important because implementing blockchain in ODR is not simple. It requires deep know-how in areas like cryptography and programming. This means training the agency team or partnering with blockchain experts. And while blockchain is generally secure, improper implementation of smart contracts can introduce vulnerabilities. To avoid these risks through testing and auditing, our systems are essential to ensure their safety. In closing, the road to integrating blockchain in ODR may have a few bumps, but the destination that is a more efficient, transparent, and dispute resolution process is definitely worth the journey. For this paper, we use the example of Kleros 
I will not enter into that practical case as Federico As, founder, uh, founder and CEO of Cleros, will intervene in showing how this blockchain-based platform for dispute resolution works. Let's go now uh, to AI and its role in enhancing LDR. Um, this is another crucial technology in dispute resolution. In our data-driven world, AI can process vast information volumes, offering insight that were once out of uh, reach. AI influence ODR, um, the influence already is completely varied. Fundamentally, it can automate routine tasks, such as sorting disputes or identifying relevant legal precedents. This uh, not only accelerates the resolution process, but also allows human arbitration to concentrate on dispute needing empathy and judgment. Beyond automating tasks, AI play an important role in analyzing dispute data. With machine learning, AI can find patterns and trends in disputes. This goes beyond just resolving single cases. It helps improve the entire system by identifying and addressing common problems before they happen. Things, uh, think about technologies like large lingual models. This show how good AI is at understanding and creating complex text. When using online dispute resolution, AI can review dispute details, identify important information, and suggest solutions based on past cases and legal reasoning, making the process faster and, and more consistent. However, integrating AI into ODR requires caution. A key concern is safeguarding privacy and data security. AI systems handling sensitive dispute information must be fortified against data breaches. Ethical challenges are also paramount. AI impartially depends on its training data. Without careful design and training, AI may inherit existing biases. Hence, human oversight is essential to ensure fairness and justice in AI-assisted resolution. For government agencies, using AI transparency is essential. It's about making AI decision-making process clear so agencies can see how conclusions are reached this clearly helps align AI, AI outputs with the agency's goals and values. Ensuring AI decisions are understandable and trustworthy is vital for the confident adopting in government work. To sum up, AI offers significant potential to advance online dispute resolution. Its capabilities in automatic task pattern analysis and insight generation can lead to more effective and streamlined processes. Yet, as we leverage AI strength, we must remain alert to ethical privacy and security concerns, ensuring that our system champions justice responsibly. Let's now um, move to chatbots. And after discussing AI roles in enhancing LDR through automation and data analysis, we now focus on chatbots, a uh, practical user facing AI application in dispute resolution. Chatbots simplify the initial stages by helping users gather information, categorize disputes, and guide them through the resolution process, especially for those unfamiliar with legal procedures. Beyond initial interaction, chatbots could automate early steps like assessment and data collection, freeing human experts to handle more complex cases. Advanced chatbots using technologies like large language models can address language barriers and offer clear guidance, making this peer resolution more accessible globally. However, accuracy and data privacy are key challenges. While chatbots enhance efficiency, they should support, not replace human judgment and empathy. Overall, they have great potential to streamline and improve ODR systems. When integrating technologies like blockchain, AI and chatbots into ODR, it is important to consider their impact on different legal systems worldwide. Adopting these technologies require understanding various legal frameworks, cultural contexts, and policies. For example, blockchain in ODR faces different levels of regulatory acceptance and legal recognition. Countries like Estonia have advanced digital legal processes, but other regions may need legal reforms to accommodate to such technologies. AI and chatbots also raise data protection concerns, especially in areas with strict privacy laws like the EU GDPR, requiring careful compliance. A phased approach starting with a pilot project in specific legal settings can help test and improve these technologies. 
collaborating with legal experts and policymakers ensure the technology aligns with legal standards and user needs. Training legal professionals is also essential to smooth adoption. I will stop here as I believe I have covered the key points of this paper written by uh, Angtar. This also shed light on the way forward. And these conclusions were further developed in the technical cooperation project uh, that my colleagues Anna and William will present later today. Allow me now to pass the floor to Federico Ast from Cleros, who will demonstrate the practical use of blockchain in an ODR platform. Federico, thank you very much for being with us. Hello, how are you? Thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, super happy to be here. So um, let me tell you a bit about um, Cleros and Centralized Justice. So Cleros is the name of the project of the company, but this is a new field called Centralized Justice that is a new way of understanding the digital solution. It's based on three main pillars. First, the idea of crowdsourcing, the idea of the dispute being solved, not by like the lawyers or experts, but, but by the community, by citizens, by users, the idea of peer-to-peer digital -peer solution. Then the use of game theory to produce the right incentive for people to behave correctly and reach a, a, a process that is extremely efficient and, and fast. And also the use of, of uh, blockchain to enhance transparency. All of the digital solution process is going to be auditable and verifiable on the blockchain. Um, so this makes it uh, trustable by every party that uh, participates in, in it. So these are the main tenets of centralized justice. And the, the, the key idea is that using this new methodology and mechanism, uh, centralized justice mechanism can be extremely effective and efficient, way more than traditional arbitration methods done online, you know, which are basically like a mini trial on Zoom, which are of course more efficient than going to like a, a hearing or a court, but just like 30, 40% more efficient. With these new different mechanisms, um, centralized justice can be 10x more efficient. It's solving a dispute from on Claro, for example, can cost a few dozen dollars, um, can take just like three or four days. So this is how fast the and efficient the, the method is. Where can this be applied? Um, in commerce, you know, the field between buyers and, and sellers. Well, uh, Marilla was uh, telling us a bit about um, Mercado Libre, so this can be applied to that type of use case. Think insurance, uh, policyholder against insurance company for uh, payment on some car crash, repair, stuff like that. Think um, consumer claims, you know, uh, electricity, bill, utilities, etc. All of those small claims, uh, cool type of cases. And also think cases for the future, like esports. E you know, things is happening when in an esports tournament when some team accuses the other of cheating. So how can you solve this? It's hard to solve the traditional methods. And this is where decentralized justice can can be very good. Um, what we see in the future of the solution is going to be like a division of labor in like three main um, topics. Um, so for more simple cases, objective cases, AI will probably solve them better. For cases requiring more context, more understanding of the situation, um, probably centralized justice is going to be useful. And then for even more complex cases involving legal reasoning or like uh, multiple parties, this is still going to be resolved by traditional you know, mechanisms. Let me just tell you just how this can be applied in two uh, examples. So one of the private sector, we are uh, working in a, in a company called Lemon, which is a fintech company from Argentina, but operating in different parts in Latin America. Um, they had a lot of disputes with users because they claimed that they were charged for something they didn't buy, stuff like that. So they had a process of a digital solution where user would make the claim to the company, the company would uh, evaluate it and maybe say yes or no. If they said no, so the customer would only go to small claims court. We uh, implemented a system where after the company says no to the customer, it offers him or her the possibility of going to this neutral decision-making system called Claros, uh, and uh, then uh, the company will um, pledge to abide by the Claros ruling uh, in the case the customer wins. So the company will just pay whatever the customer requires. But if the customer loses, it doesn't take any, any he can still go to small claims court, it doesn't take any access to justice rights from the consumer affair. So this is one way of implementing this in the private sector. And then something which is very recent, just was um, like that time last week, um, pilot uh, to be done 
with uh, the uh, peace court in Mendoza, Argentina, uh, that is going to use uh, Cleros still at the final level to analyze cases happening uh, consumer neighbor disputes. Um, so citizens will be able to file a claim, and then um, this claim will go to resolve by, by clear of jurors who are going to analyze the evidence and produce a decision. And then this is going to be analyzed by the uh, uh, justice and then um, implemented if, if no problem arrives. So, so this is the first time this is actually going to be used in um, public sector uh, as a decision support tool. Um, and just one last thing worth mentioning. Uh, last um, January, the Mexico enacted a new law to do solution for the mechanisms of this resolution, and uh, it accepts the centralized justice mechanisms as valid to do solution methodologies in the Mexican uh, jurisdiction. So this is an extremely important um, advance done recently, and was not in the report uh, that Valentina presented because it was it happened a few months ago. So this is going to be, we think. Um, pushing forward a lot of these new mechanisms based on crowdsourcing and centralization. Uh, so just two more things. Uh, hopefully we can um, implement these new ideas in different jurisdictions. If you would like to think how this can be applied in your country, with which we would like to, to push this forward. And also run more pilots like the one in Mendoza. This would be a great way to push forward these ideas and uh, bring access to justice for more people around the world. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer questions later if you want. Muchas gracias, Federico. Thank you very much. I think we have a good idea of how these modern regulations and modern systems could take dispute resolution for consumers forward. Let us now move to my dear speakers, and that is Nidhi Kari, Secretary of the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Government of India, and Katia Peñalosa. Director of Consumer Protection of the National Institute for the Defense of Competition and the Protection of Intellectual Property. I have one question for each of my speakers. Ms. Kare, India has been spearheading efforts to facilitate cross-border online dispute resolution for consumers. I wonder whether we have Ms. Kare I can see you now, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Excellent. Hello, Ms. Kare. As I was saying, India has been spearheading efforts to facilitate cross-border online dispute resolution for consumers. What are the next steps that the Department of Consumer Affairs plans to take to enhance in this direction? Consider that 26% of e-commerce in India is cross-border. Is there a plan to incorporate a feature specifically for cross-border disputes in India's national system? And finally, can you share any details about the technology that is to be used? Over to you, ma'am. Uh, so I have a, a small presentation, if you allow me to uh, share. Is that possible? Please, go ahead. Upload. So I suppose it is visible. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yes. Right. So um, as you all know that uh, the consumer protection law has witnessed a progressive change from the maxim caveat emptor, that is, let the buyer be here, to caveat venditor, uh, which means let the seller be here, and after. Uh, you know, 1986, this concept of consumer, it was basically to, uh, to ensure that uh, the emerging new challenges uh, which are uh, coming up, they need to be effectively dealt with by the Consumer Protection Act 2019. Now, under the UN guidelines, we already, uh, we have, uh, you know, called for expeditious, fair, inexpensive and accessible redressal of consumer disputes. 
in under the new uh, consumer law also in india it provides for a framework for a speedy hassle free and inexpensive redressal of consumer grievances and it has also made sure that the commission's endeavor that the complaint is actually redressed within 3 months if it does not require any analysis or test on commodities and otherwise within 5 months in case it requires any analysis or testing of commodities also india established the central consumer protection authority which has powers to pass uh, discontinuation of practices that are unfair and prejudicial to consumer rights and to impose penalties in case of false and misleading advertisements the oecd guidelines for consumer protection in the context of electronic commerce state that consumers should be provided with meaningful access to fair and timely dispute resolution and redress with, uh, without undue cost or burden so under the digital india initiative this has actually we have tried to digitize all the consumer commissions starting with national consumer uh, the apex body the national consumer redressal uh, commission as well as the state uh, consumer res uh, resolution uh, commissions and we have also introduced an e dakhil system where people can from various geographies can actually file and get their uh grievances uh, registered there is also a national consumer helpline which operates to actually ensure that petty consumer complaints are actually redressed now we have a three tier consumer dispute redressal system because india is a large country very diverse but we have a very simplified dispute resolution process Uh, we have also provision for alternate dispute redressal through mediation and which is sometimes even uh, we can say one is the court annexed mediation and the other is also which we are doing uh, rather frequently is through i mean out of court settlement there are product liabilities for manufacturers service providers and product sellers and penalties for adulteration of products and sale of spurious goods now this is the consumer protection framework that we have in our country it basically starts with the national consumer helpline where if the consumer is not satisfied by the manufacturer's response to his grievances he lodges a complaint on the national consumer helpline i will take you to its features later in the presentation then there is consumer dispute redressal commission where along with his petty demand for replacement or refund and other things he can also lay claim to compensation to mental agony which was caused to him there is also a central consumer protection authority which basically takes up uh, say information intelligence from nch and either on suo moto can also have class action matters and then there is e dakhil and compnet which is basically the digitization of the entire legal framework so if we see it starts with say uh, the complaint which can be filed from anywhere irrespective of the place of residence or work the e filing is uh, you know of the cases is allowed so there is no requirement to actually visit a consumer commission they can do it digitally and then uh, the hearing can also happen through video conferencing there is time bound disposal of cases product liability is ensured there is penalty for adulterated and spurious goods redressal through uh, mediation for alternate dispute resolution and then for class action there is ccpa and uh, e-commerce has been specifically uh, you know dealt with by bringing specific rules for e-commerce as well as direct selling now as we know we have six consumer rights that we recognize in our country 
which is right to safety, right to information, right to choice, right to be heard, right to seek redressal, and right to consumer education. And this is the grievance redressal mechanism that we have. So while we are actually offering a lot of alternate dispute resolution at the National Consumer Helpline stage, which is largely out of uh, court settlement, then we have class action matters which are taken. The information is taken from the National Consumer Helpline and we get to know how many consumers are actually having similar say complaints about a certain manufacturer or a service provider. And if we find that it is violating consumer rights or it is false or misleading advertisement or is also a part of unfair trade practice, then we can simply uh, initiate class action. And then there is a three tier uh, the system of consumer commissions, which are basically at the national, state and district levels. Some of the newly launched initiatives for consumer protections has been through guidelines, through bringing you know, guidance for uh, different stakeholders. So for example, we came out with guidelines on social media influencers and uh, endorsers, which are uh, today one of the largest influencers who are operating through various uh, say platforms like Meta, uh, Instagram, you know, Telegram, WhatsApp, and so on. There is another one, which is uh, a guidelines for hotels and restaurants not to charge, uh, not to levy service charge. Uh, we came out with guidelines for prevention of misleading advertisements and endorsements for misleading advertisements in 2022. An additional influencer guide booklet for health and wellness celebrities, influencers, and virtual uh, influencers was also, uh, it was launched into 2023. There is guidelines for prevention uh, of uh, dark patterns, which are being used extensively in e-commerce. A right to repair web portal has been launched where all information with regards to self-repair, uh, authorized repair, you know, manuals for repair of goods, of the products, uh, and also, say, third-party empaneled uh, repairers, uh, all that is given. It also has information about the availability of spare parts, where genuine spare parts are available and things like that. We have also come out with a standard on fake and deceptive reviews, which are commonly used in e-commerce. So some of the dark patterns that uh, is normally used is basically, uh, it also finds mention under the unfair trade practice under the Consumer Protection Act. So this is something where uh, consumers from cross-border also can access our systems to make sure that their uh, rights are protected too. Of course, these are types of dark patterns, I'm sure everybody knows. These are the objectives of right to repair framework where we are trying to democratize availability of repair manuals, videos, and spare parts to the consumers. We are also trying to protect the consumer against planned obsolescence. We are trying to replace uh, the use and dispose economy with circular economy and mindless consumption with mindful utilization. And our focus is on the three R's, which is reduce through repair, reuse, and recycle. This is how it looks like the repair portal. We are concentrating on four sectors to begin with, like automobile, consumer durables, mobile and electronics, and farm equipments. And these are the three things that we are trying to focus on by providing for repair manuals or self-repair, details of authorized service centers, recognized third-party repairers, availability of genuine spare parts, address the concern of uh, country of origin, price, products, and components, and explicitly mention the differences in liability uh, for the consumer with regards to guarantee and extended guarantee of the product. 
We are also trying, we are in the process of actually making repairability index. This is basically very, very crucial in evaluating the sustainability of the product. It will also promote circular economy, reducing e-waste, and each product will be rated on a scale where we are trying to build, uh, I mean, this basically will have the availability of spare parts, the prices, product specific, the disassembly, self repair, and things like that, how it, easy it is for the consumer to have full control uh, over the product. And then further, it will encourage the manufacturers in enhancing their product designs and making it repairable. This was the standard on fake and deceptive reviews in e-commerce. I'm sure as, uh, you know, as we are, you know, in a global market uh, system, it is very, very important to also say that many of the reviews on which consumers base their decision on are basically, uh, they are fake, they are from unreliable sources, and many times they are also paid. So in different geographies outside of a country, many of the companies are simply paid to write you know, absolutely false and fake reviews. And this is part of, you know, that is kind of cheating the consumers, uh, you know. So we are also trying that this standard, uh, by having this standard as a voluntary standard for the, uh, for the e-commerce, we are trying to have methods for verification of the review author to check traceability. We have provision for both automated and manual moderation. And then we are developing a code of practice and necessary stipulations like accessibility criteria and ensuring content which does not contain financial information. Madam Secretary, I'm going to ask you in the interest of time to please start wrapping up your presentation. Oh, Thank okay. you. So I think I will just take about two minutes from here. So we have this uh, National Consumer Helpline and we have about 967 companies which are in convergence partner. We have an interactive voice response. So it uh, helps in getting the complaints registered faster. And then there is an auto generated, uh, you know, effort for the consumers to look for, they can track and trace the updation. So uh, we have, uh, I mean, this omni-channel system, actually consumers from across the borders can also engage uh, in uh, getting their uh, disputes registered through the web portals, emails, NCH app, WhatsApp, and so on. We are already uh, registering complaints in 17 languages. And so therefore we have about, I mean, this is within the country, of course, uh, but uh, there is also a callback request that can come directly to the call agent. Uh, we are using automations and enhanced, uh, you know, I, IT tools, uh, largely to basically have, ensure that the facility of auto population of repeat grievances is also established. There is an automated feedback mechanism there is a callback request option through IVR, and then there is a multilingual chatbot integration. Uh, so people who are not satisfied uh, with the complaint, uh, with the grievance redressal on the NCH, they can simply move on the e hill where they can simply take the advantage of registering their complaint on the national, state, and district consumer commissions. So this, I have already said, uh, we, uh, I would just like to uh, give, you know, the sector-wise uh, complaints that, have, that we have got registered. And as you would see, 32% actually comes from e-commerce followed by other sectors like banking, consumer durables, electronic products, and so on. And these are the dockets that uh, we have been, uh, I mean, it is seen arise uh, through different years. 
Most of the common grievances that uh, we have analyzed is deficiency in services or paid amount not refunded, followed by overcharging, demand of excess amount, and so on. So integration of pre-litigation online dispute uh, redressal mechanism with NCH, we are trying to take an initiative of providing uh, this mechanism to the consumers to meet this objective for uh, all consumers. And we are trying to develop a pre-litigation ODR platform with the use of AI and blockchain. And uh, the complete workflow of the pre-litigation OTR, OTR platform uh, will be basically divided in these four parts where consent of both parties has to be there, selection of mediator to conduct pre-litigation ODR, uh, conduct of pre-litigation ODR proceedings have to be there and the mediation agreement. So I think I'm done with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. And if you would like to send us your presentation, we will make it available in the event page along with the video of and the recording of the um, of the panel. I would now like to move to my second panelist, Katia Peñalosa, Director of Consumer Protection at the National Institute for the Defense of Competition and the Protection of Intellectual Property of Peru. And Katia, Peru's consumer arbitration system offers free dispute resolution for consumers and is voluntary for businesses. What steps would Indecopy and the consumer protection agencies of the Pacific Alliance member countries state to integrate the systems effectively across the region? And what role do you foresee in this sense for international cooperation and for UNCTAD. Katia. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Over in Peru. to you. Good afternoon. In your case, first of all, and very quickly, I would like to extend my sincere thanks for your kind um, invitation to In the Copy to discuss the need for consumer protection and dispute resolution mechanisms in the digital era. As you may know, In the Copy, is in charge of sanctioning uh, procedures that could be initiated as a result of a consumer individual complaint. In this case, the consumer is considered a party um, and he or she has to pay a fee about uh, $8 to present his or her case to um, the resolution bodies. If the authority found the complaint well-founded, the trader must pay a fine, comply with a corrective measure um, in favor of the consumer and also reimburse the cost and expenses of the procedure. But the Peruvian Consumer Protection Code has also introduced the figure of consumer ar arbitration, which I will discuss with you today. So um, what is consumer arbitration? It is a dispute uh, resolution mechanism when the consumer and the trader seek to resolve their dispute before a third party, the arbitrator, and has the following characteristics. Uh, first of all, it is uh, voluntary for both parties. It's free of charge for both parties. There is no fee. It is very simple because it, because it is more flexible than an uh, administrative procedure. Uh, the notification, for example, and the hearings are virtual. It is binding. It is the, uh, It has the character of a res judicata, uh, like a judicial, uh, la, like a judicial uh, sentence. It is fast. The procedure lasts uh, about forty-five working days. It is confidential. Uh, it also provides a compensation. I, I would like to stop here, like for a, a couple of seconds. As I referred previously, when a consumer complained, he or she can receive a corrective measure in his or her favor. If the consumer wants a, um, any kind of compensation, uh, it has to go to court. However, in the consumer arbitration, compensation can be ordered when the damage is fully proved. Um, the the um, arbitration system is also free of fines. 
but also the Consumer Protection Code establishes that um, the consumer's uh, voluntary submission excludes the possibility to initiate an administrative procedure. And finally, it's free of costs and expenses. Neither the consumer nor the trader has the possibility of requesting the costs and expenses of the procedure. So how does the consumer arbitration work? The consumer must file a request for arbitration. In order to, to, in order to initiate an arbitral uh, procedure, the, there are three scenarios. The consumer must present a, a document or a contract with an arbitration clause incorporated. Um, the consumer request for arbitration against a trader that has already submitted to the arbitration system, or the consumer request for arbitration against against a trader that has not submitted uh, for, to the arbitration system, but when the trader is notified with a request, he or she accepts to take part in this mechanism. Once the trader's acceptance has been verified, an arbitrator is appointed and this arbitrator verifies the admissibility requirements, summons the parties to a single hearing, and finally issues the award. Now, I would like to uh, share with you that an arbitration process has been processed against a trader domiciliated abroad in which the effectiveness of consumer arbitration was ratified since the award was uh, executed and the consumer was able to receive the return of his money as well as a compensation for consequential damage. I must highlight that in this case, the trader was not submitted to the Peruvian arbitration system, but, but was notified by in the copy and accepted the arbitration request. So let's see very quickly the case. We have now uh, the facts. An arbitration claim was filed against a trader domiciliated abroad, um, but the effects uh, of consumer relationship occur in the national territory. The claim was for reimbursement of the money paid to purchase uh, to air tickets, about uh, $180, and payment of damages, $15. In other cases, notification, appearance, and even compliance with the other itself would have been limited. The electronic notification to the Consumer Arbitration Board resulted in the appearance of the referred supplier who replied to the claim and requested that it uh, be declared unfounded. What was the outcome? The arbitration found that the claim was well-founded and ordered the foreign supplier to pay the following in compensation, $180 for air tickets and the $15 in damages. Despite the appeals against the award, which were declared inadmissible, the respondent notified compliance with the award. This situation confirmed consumer arbitration as an effective and uh, binding mechanism for resolving consumer disputes and uh, market and institutional milestone. So e-commerce has been steadily growing economic sector since 2010 and since the pandemic, uh, we have witnessed the remarkable expansion of transaction and the corresponding increase of consumer complaints. So it is crucial to reinforce cross-border dispute resolution frameworks that facilitate consumer redress. Consumer arbitration has proven to be an, an effective mechanism for cross-border dispute resolution as compliance has been achieved despite restrictions on appearance and, uh, or notification. The flexibility of consumer arbitration is a feature that any dispute resolution mechanism should have in order to continue the process and above all to resolve the substance of the dispute. Now, in order to, um, uh, to, to, the, question, uh, to the question you ask, first I must uh, acknowledge that due to the pandemic, many of the service offered by consumer protection uh, agencies have been digitized. Uh, this uh, has allowed us to reach a wider population, which represents a significant advancement for our institutions. However, um, I believe it's essential to strengthen our uh, capabilities through three key uh, action lines. Uh, the first is uh, peer collaboration. Uh, for example, establishing memorandums of understanding 
between consumer protection agencies is crucial for accessing uh, the necessary elements for investigations. This agreement facilitates everything from notifying parties involved to gathering additional information that improve case analysis. Um, such collaborations um, equip us with more tools and uh, streamline process. Uh, secondly, um, it's important to strengthen uh, regional networks. Um, a regional framework helps manage cross-border disputes and provide access to practices that, once adapted to each economy, can en enhance our effectiveness. Um, the third point is to enhance consumer awareness. Authorities must work in educating consumers about the rights in the digital marketplaces and providing accessible, um, user-friendly channels for filling uh, complaints. This is essential for building trust and ensuring that consumers feel supported by institutions. Lastly, regarding UNTAC, uh, UNTAC's role, um, I see it as a key facilitator. UNTAC uh, can foster dialogue and uh, collaboration among authorities, promoting the standardization and legal harmonization necessary to create an efficient dispute resolution system. Uh, additionally, UNTAD can provide technical assistance supporting countries with the, technology, the technological and legal experiences needed to develop or, um, or improve their digital uh, system. Uh, that would be it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Katia, for this very edifying presentation with very concrete cases. You already answered a key concern of mine, which was what can UNCTAD do in this field, especially in, the, in um, applying technology and technological solutions. I would like perhaps to ask this question to Ms. Carey, if she is still online. I'm not really sure because this is very late in India right now. But Madam Secretary, in your view, what is UNCTAD's role um, in the application of technology solutions in ODR in general? What is UNCTAD's role in online dispute resolution for consumers? Over so to you, Madam. I think UNCTAD uh, should have, uh, you know, should prescribe for a uniform, standardized, uh, you know, process. Uh, because that will uh, be, you know, honored across uh, the nations. Otherwise, we are largely bound by, uh, you know, mutual reciprocity between nations. So it is important that Antar should actually uh, take up, you know, different uh, methods in solving it and bring a standardized practice. Thank you so much, madam. And you've actually gave me a very nice landing cue to the next section of our webinar. As we bring to the close this second section on what is next, we want to present to you um, a presentation by UN Trade and Development colleagues, experts in um, technology and in consumer protection on a technical cooperation proposal on online dispute resolution that we have been developing for over two years now. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleagues, Ana Candida Municipriano, legal officer at the Competition and Consumer Policies Branch of UNCTAD, and William Taborda, information system officer at the Information Technology Services, also of UNCTAD. Anna, William, over to you. Thank you very much, Renal. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Anna Cipriano, legal officer at the UN Trade and Development. And it is with great pressure that I will share, share with my colleague, William Taborda, the findings uh, from our extensive research on consumer online dispute resolution or ODR and how it is possible to transform uh, consumer protection on a global scale. Our team has explored uh, numerous models and features 
with a sharp focus on understanding consumer protection, what consumer protection authorities and consumers truly need. So uh, UN Trade and Development UNCTAD is therefore uniquely positioned to offer a solid global ODR model that aligns with international standards, especially those of the United Nations guidelines for consumer protection, also known as UNGCP. So let's start with why consumer dispute resolution or CDR is crucial. Consumers around the world face many challenges, uh, some of them already mentioned throughout uh, this session today, in resolving disputes. So from courts to collective redress mechanisms to public and regulatory actions and alternative dispute resolution, there are several pathways, but the systems are not often uh, accessible, uh, difficult sometimes to navigate, they don't consider consumers' vulnerabilities and what consumer agencies need to deliver accessible, free for consumers, fast and efficient dispute resolution channels. Moreover, the terminology and systems also differ from uh, one place to another, depending on the country, the authority, or even the type of business that can mislead uh, consumers especially when dealing in, with a case involving con a consumer and a business with different nationalities or domicile. At the global level, uh, we lack a robust unified legal framework for consumer dispute resolution. This is a key obstacle to creating a common global uh, consumer dispute resolution platform, especially for cross-border disputes. And for, consume, uh, for countries uh, trying to implement these um, systems, applying private international law to consumer dispute cases adds an even more complex complexity. This is why harmonizing consumer and contract law at the international level needs to be considered. And by doing so, it is possible to deliver a reference framework to guide them in establishing and operating member states' own cross-border ODR systems. We believe that uh, such a system can ensure fairness and ease of use for consumers worldwide. worldwide. So according to the study we carried on and also presented here, the Consumer Dispute Resolution in the World publication, you have the link uh, on the chat. Uh, what makes a uh, consumer, uh, consumer dispute system effective? So basically, it must be fast, fair, transparent, and inexpensive. Additionally, the consumer experience should be at the center of any system, ensuring it's user-friendly and easy and easily accessible. Why? So let me give you three reasons access to justice, building trust, and saving judicial courses, judicial uh, resources. In many regions, consumers have, um, avoid pursuing justice because the available systems are too complex, expensive, or simply too uh, slow. This deprives them of their right to seek redress, a right recognized by the United Nations guidelines for consumer protection. And a global uh, consumer dispute resolution system is essential to closing this justice gap. Studies show that when consumer disputes are resolved quickly and effectively, it leads to greater trust in businesses. This trust is especially important in today's digital economy. When consumers have a positive dispute resolution experiences, they are more likely to return to the business. This boosts, um, in turn, this boosts consumer confidence and it helps the entire digital economy grow. Many consumer dispute, uh, disputes are low value claims that don't need even to go to court. A well-designed consumer dispute resolution system can handle this uh, efficiently, freeing up courts of more complex cases for more complex cases. 
In fact, tra trained case handlers can solve most com consumer disputes without involving courts, saving both time and judicial court resources. Now, um, regarding the future of online dispute resolution, uh, we have discussed earlier that it is promising thanks to emerging technologies that can, can make these uh, systems faster and more efficient. However, many countries face significant barriers. Some lack the technological expertise while others lack budget to implement modern uh, systems. Legal frameworks are often outdated or incomplete, further complicating the efforts. This is where UNCTAD comes in. Through technical assistance and capacity building initiatives, UNCTAD plays a vital role in helping um, countries to overcome these challenges. Our vision is to help build a consumer dispute system that is accessible, effective for consumers around the world with a particular attention to vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers. These systems should be regarded as a public good, ensuring that all consumers can access fair dispute resolution. Therefore, the wor workflow that we developed charters a model that is less resource intensive and can be easily adapted to national realities. The model favors less civil servants, direct intervention, conferring speed and neutrality to the process, public hosting, having the authorities mandated with consumer protection law and or policy to monitor uh, this platform, assisted communication, and a final agreement between the parties that can be enforced in court. The idea is to incorporate the workflow we created into a project proposal, which we are happy to discuss with interested member states and development partners. So here are some key objectives for an ideal consumer dispute uh, resolution system. Deliver efficient uh, dispute resolution mechanisms that address the unique needs of vulnerable consumers. Encourage the growth of public and private uh, consumer dispute resolution bodies to ensure a broad sectoral coverage. Implement public uh, reporting systems for regular uh, evaluation and monitoring by the authorities. Promote business participation in this process and in some cases consider making it mandatory. Including businesses in this process, we are fostering cooperation and trust. Enhance consumer awareness of consumer dispute resolution systems through educational campaigns and outreach. It is their right to have access to dispute resolution. Explore consumer dispute resolution bodies mandates and consider strategies to increase com compliance. And finally, uh, international cooperation is essential for resolving cross-border disputes efficiently. To move forward, we need to strengthen, strengthen international dialogue, uh, share best practices, and foster cooperation among all stakeholders, governments, businesses, consumer associations, and legal experts. UNCTAD can deliver a global consumer dispute, a system that is not only fair and effective, but also accessible to everyone, regardless where they live, the resources they have. I will pass now the floor to my colleague, William Taborda, to explain the technical and technological aspects of a global a CDR system worked by Ancted. Thank you very much. We cannot hear you, William. You're me muted. now. I think it's now we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone in your respective meridian. 
they'll be presenting a comprehensive vision for a collaborative open source online dispute resolution system that has the potential to improve consumer protection on a global scale. As the boundaries between physical and digital marketplaces blur, effective online dispute resolution systems are crucial. They protect the rights and maintain trust in global commerce. However, the implementation of state-of-the-art ODR platforms present significant challenges in many countries. For example, the lack of expertise in developing and maintaining complex digital systems called technological barriers, limited budget for implementing and updating sophisticated platforms, diverse regulatory framework and unclear divisions of powers among authority, it's common. Difficulty in keeping pace with evolving consumer dispute patterns and emerging technologies. Challenges in addressing dispute that span multiple jurisdictions and the scalability concern, which is the challenge of handling increased case volume efficiently. These challenges are further compounded by the resource intensive nature of developing, maintaining, and continuously improving ODR systems at a technological level. The result is a global landscape where access to effective consumer protection varies widely, potentially leaving many consumers vulnerable. Our proposed solution address these multifaceted issues through a collaborative effort by leveraging the collective expertise and resources of UN Trade and Development. I will try to call it UNTD and let's see if it sticks. <laughs> UN member states and other stakeholders um, we aim to develop an open source, customizable ODR platform that can adapt to diverse needs while promoting global standards in consumer protection. Now let's dive into the key components of the, such an ODR system. This represents the minimal requirements that we'll take into account as we move forward with development. At the core, will need user-friendly interfaces. The system should provide an intuitive platform for consumers to submit complaints and streamline processes for business to respond. These interfaces must guide users step-by-step, step, ensuring all necessary information is captured without overwhelming them. Pre-mediation and mediation models will be crucial. The system should facilitate direct communication between parties to encourage early resolution. It would also include tools for agency intervention when needed. Flexibility is the key here. The system needs to accommodate various dispute resolution approaches across different jurisdictions. Robust data management and reporting capabilities are essential. We envision powerful tools for storing and analyzing dispute data, allowing agencies to easily identify trends and generate reports. This will support informed policymaking and targeted public information campaign. Integration capabilities are a must. The system should offer well-documented APIs to connect seamlessly with existing databases and case management platforms. Our aim is to enhance, enhance not disrupt current workflows. The boost efficiency, or to boost efficiency, we are considered AI enhanced features. This could include chatbots for initial claim triage, automated analysis of common disputes, and assisted drafting tools. Such features would speed up the process and improve consistency in dispute handling. Finally, robust privacy and security measures are non negotiable. The system must adopt a privacy by default design, ensuring compliance with global data protection regulations. Strong safeguards against unauthorized access and provision for regular security audits should be built into the system's architecture. These components form the foundation of a comprehensive yet flexible system that can adapt to needs of diverse consumer protection agencies worldwide. Challenges and UNTD's role. While the technical development of this ODR system is crucial, we anticipate several key challenges that go beyond coding and software design. 
First and foremost is the task of adapting to different legal frameworks. The system will be flexible enough to accommodate these differences while still maintaining a cohesive structure. Another significant challenge lies in ensuring interoperability with existing systems. Many countries and organizations already have established processes and technologies. Our ODR system needs to provide integration options with all the systems to truly be effective and widely adopted. Defining requirements and satisfy most stakeholders present its own set of difficulties. With so many countries and organizations involved, each with their own needs and priorities, finding common ground will require careful negotiation and compromise. Perhaps our most complex challenge is fostering cooperation among diverse participants. This project will bring together stakeholders from various cultural, legal, and technological backgrounds. Encouraging effective collaboration among these diverse groups will be essential to our success. To address these challenges, UNTD is uniquely positioned to play a central role in managing a global open source code repository for this ODR system, facilitating cooperation among contributors. This is contributors to the code ensuring consistency and avoiding duplication of work. Leveraging established relationships with consumer protection agencies worldwide to ease adoption and foster effective communication. Establish mechanisms for feature requests and development prioritizations. Ensure that development efforts are focused on widely beneficial, beneficial improvements execute special developments when specific budgets are allocated or donated, coordinating a collaborative development model, ensuring diverse voices are heard and considered. And finally, overseeing a phase implementation strategy, starting with core functionalities to deliver value quickly while laying the groundwork for more complex features. UNTD's global reach and expertise in international trade and development make it ideally suited to oversee this project, balancing the needs of various stakeholders and driving the initiative forward. By managing the open source repository and facilitating cooperation, UNTD can ensure that the ODR system remains adaptable, relevant, and beneficial to all participant countries. Now let's go to the benefits of such a collaboration building code. By pooling resources and expertise, we can significantly lower development costs for all participants. This approach makes cutting edge ODR technology accessible even to agencies with limited budget. Collaborative development brings together diverse perspectives, fostering innovation, the open source nature of encourages uh, the open source nature encourages transparency, creating a worldwide community of ODR experts and contributing to global capacity building around the world. The system's modular design allows for easy addition of new features, enabling the platform to adapt to unique needs of individual countries. This flexibility ensures relevance across different jurisdictions and legal frameworks. And finally, by establishing shared frameworks and standards, this solution provides commonalities among systems, meaning that this system, duplications of the same system can easily talk to each other, therefore enabling potential interoperability for future cross-border cases, including interoperability with third-party systems, such as third parties platforms for decision-making, such as the ones we saw today, or other pre-existent ODRs. The development, ongoing adaptation, and maintenance of a global ODR system is undoubtedly a costly and resource-intensive endeavor. However, it is precisely because of these substantial costs and resource requirements that all propose collaborative approach is so crucial. By leveraging the efficiency of collaboration, we can achieve several critical objectives. Number one, efficient resource allocation. Pooling resources and expertise allows 
for more efficient allocation of both financial and human capital. Number two, homogeneous ODR practices. Perhaps most importantly, this co collaborative approach will pave the way for more homogeneous ODR practices worldwide. By working together on a shared platform, we naturally move towards standardization of processes, data formats, and best practices. This homogeneity will not only improve the efficiency of cross-border dispute resolution, but also elevate the overall quality of consumer protection globally. Third, and finally, the continuous innovation. With a diverse group of stakeholders contributing to the system's development and maintenance, we ensure a constant influx of ideas and innovations. These collaborative ecosystems will drive continuous improvement keeping the ODR system at the forefront of technological and legal advancement. In conclusion, while the task before us is indeed resource intensive, it is through collaboration that we can turn this challenge into an opportunity. By working together, we can create an ODR system that is not only cost effective, but also drives global standard in consumer protection. This initiative represents a significant step towards a more equitable, efficient, and harmonized approach to consumer dispute resolution worldwide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, William, and of course, Anna. Thank you very much also to my uh, panelists, Nidhi Kare and Katia Peñalosa. We have very limited time left and a lot of issues that were covered where we may have time for one or maximum two interventions. So if there is anyone who would like to take the floor to contribute to this discussion if for a two minute period, please raise your hand and I will give you the floor. I don't see any requests for the floor. Am I correct, uh, Valentina? That is correct. Well, then you're giving me some more time to share my conclusion before we close this event, this webinar. I just want to be sure that there's no request for the floor at this moment. I yes. see there is one request, Babatunde Adedeji. Uh, Please, you have the floor. Yeah, good evening, all. My name is Adedeji Babatunde Abiodun. I'm the founder, coordinator, uh, executive director, Consumers Empowerment Organization of Nigeria, an NGO, Nigeria. So I uh, really commend uh, all the speakers and the well thought uh, of publication that uh, was delivered today. But my request is this. Um, I want to know in details what rules that consumer protection uh, association or organization can play in the ODR system. Because uh, all the speakers, uh, specifically, they narrated the role of the government agencies, consumer protection agency, but uh, limited uh, uh, a uh, rose uh, was mentioned for consumer protection association so that is my uh, request or comment thank you very much sir i think that there is a big role for consumers associations to play there's various aspects where consumer associations can um can contribute to online dispute resolution from raising awareness to collecting consumer complaints to advising consumers to even providing um, dispute resolutions if the system so allows. And there are some examples. I will be sharing with you an UNCTAD document entitled Enhancing the Consumer Movement Means to Facilitate the Development 
of independent consumer groups in this chat. And you will see there the various ways in which consumer groups have participated in delivering dispute resolution and redress for consumers, both at judicial and extrajudicial means. Thank, thank you, you very Eric. much for your question. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. I have four minutes left, and I don't think I need to take this much time to share my conclusions of our event. Of course, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our speakers for contributing and enriching this event, and to my colleagues at UN Trade and Development for the professionalism and commitment they have shown to online dispute resolution and dispute resolution and redress in general for consumers over the years. I have heard the various roles that have been shared for UNCTAD as a facilitator, as a hub for information, to raise awareness among businesses and consumers, to help reach agreements among government officials and governments in general, but also among governments and businesses to facilitate dispute resolution, to provide technological solutions such as translation or automatic um, uh, uh, communications among businesses and consumers, to strengthen regional frameworks, to promote harmonization, to provide technical assistance to government officials of developing countries to improve their legal and institutional frameworks and to raise their capacities. To all of this, what I hope has become clear is that UNCTAD is ready. We have a very strong mandate from the General Assembly on dispute resolution and a very particular mandate from the Intergovernmental Group of Experts, whose last July declaration on cross-border dispute resolution and redress for consumers directly request UNCTAD to participate in, in, in this endeavor. We also have the research and the analysis that is needed, and we've taken this opportunity to share with you two pieces of research that shed light and for the first time, at least at UNCTAD, really pin what are the challenges that lie ahead. But perhaps more importantly, is that we have given enough thought to be able to assist governments in improving their national and regional cooperation to deliver dispute resolution for consumers. And this is a call for the 60 participants that are with us now. If you are interested in pursuing this discussion, if you're interested in improving your national and regional cooperation, if you want to move forward and to see what is next, do get in touch with the Secretariat. We will be working from now until July 2025, when we will host our ministerial conference that takes place every five years and is delegated by the UN General Assembly to prepare a proposal of how can UNCTAD contribute to delivering and advancing dispute resolution for consumers. And we cannot do it alone. So we need you, government officials, businesses, consumer groups, the academia, to contribute to our work, to participate with your knowledge and political will to make this a reality so that any consumer around the world can have access to truly effective and affordable, swift and easy to use dispute resolution. I thank you all and I see you, tell you until next time. Take care, bye bye. Thank you very much.